This is a Manipal Hospitals podcast. I feel this medium is for those people who who love the audio medium, you know, so that you can do all your other work. You can be driving to work. You can be packing your uh, children's lunch boxes. Um, you know, and and tackling other things, and at the same time be listening. So that is the uh, plus that people will get from this show and the podcast. No, I I am a great fan of podcasts. In fact, I listen to them when I am in the car. Gives me about um, half an hour or forty five minutes of whatever I want to do in peace, and I can listen to what I have to listen and want to listen. So there are no distractions <laughs> really. How how would you like listening to yourself? Well, I'd rather listen to you rather than myself. <laughs> <laughs> As, as as always as always a pleasure to talk to you dr sudarshan balal um let us uh, jointly welcome people to the first ever episode of this podcast by manipal hospitals called the white coat world i want to begin by asking you must have been first of all a very busy day already but i'm going to take you on a little flashback to 2021 tell us what that year was like some of us you know to stay safe we were inside our homes but it was not like for you like for lakhs of doctors across the world no absolutely i think uh, the last two years have been like no other events i have ever witnessed in my life the corona pandemic was truly a black swan event that has mm. never been seen in many decades of my medical practice it was truly a bolt from the blue when it hit us in 2020 and very interestingly once the first wave was over as we were entering 2021 uh, i i usually give my new year prediction and someone had called me and said what is your prediction for 2021 and i had uh, uh, said uh, 2021 can only be better than 2020 because nothing can be worse than 2020 and then i realized how wrong i was when the delta wave struck us quite brutally actually in 2021 mm-hmm. and almost destroyed our healthcare and economy so i think uh, what we need to introspect is that each year can be either better or worse mm-hmm. i had never predicted that 2021 would be worse than 2020 so i didn't make any predictions for this new year <laughs> i said let's wait yeah. and see and mm-hmm. uh, lo and behold we had the third wave but fortunately much much less lethal and i think we are coming out of it too I'm I'm really glad to hear you say that because every day you just open the newspapers or you're scrolling up your your uh, devices for uh, latest updates and then they say uh, you know doctors across the world some of them are seeing a stealth uh, variant of of uh, uh, the covid after omicron so you know as lay persons it's it's uh, difficult to sift wh- what's right and what's not to be worried about what could just fade away Um, so one of the duties of this podcast will also be to to clear a lot of uh, you know information across many fields um you know before we actually go to uh, further in this conversation i want to tell those of uh, you know those people who are listening to us a few things about you which means i formally introduce dr balal dr sudarshan balal is the chairman of manipal hospitals but for those who have uh, you know been under his care or heard of him or heard him while he was speaking we also know that he was the best outgoing student the blue ribbon awardee right back in his uh, alma mater of the kasturba medical college manipal you've been a recipient of many gold medals uh, dr balal now uh, what also strikes me is this rare distinction of being one of the few to be triple board certified what does that mean someone like me understands that it's internal medicine it's nephrology and critical care does it mean dr balal that you're not just one but you're double and three in one doctor are you i think most doctors are many in one but i'm uh, glad that i was able to pursue all this uh, all the things that i really like uh, both within the country and outside of the country and i'm also proud to have received or conferred a fellowship by the royal college of physicians even though yes. i had never trained in the uk yes yes you know some of the other things that that uh, dr balal um, has been involved in first of all is also the chairman of stemputex research private limited 
and currently also the president of nat health which is the healthcare federation of uh, india new delhi uh, many had sworn like dr uh, balal modestly said that many doctors are many in one but being a clinician being an excellent teacher and a compassionate physician is something that uh, he's been known for and and i can speak for it given we have had many conversations we've been fellow members of the on the jury of a certain uh, social awards so it's um, it's really a good place to be and to to ask you of many things uh, dr balal which which you know coming from you will uh, will give us a lot of clarity meanwhile i also want to tell our listeners that dr balal has been in, actively involved in many social aspects and responsibilities through their family trust which is called the belange sanjeeva hegde trust so from what i read from from the site and and have heard is that it supports 1000 dialysis um, operations per year for the for the poor there are free ambulance services kidney transplant patients poor patients with kidney diseases they get subsidized care and in hebri in which is in urupi karnataka there is health insurance for the uh, poor villagers there's also scholarships for uh, medical students uh, and and uh, many such activities so for me right up what i what i find very inspiring and will be for for particularly doctors entering the profession who are going to be listening uh, uh, to this uh, show is this marrying of expertise in the medical field but plus also being a socially responsible citizen you know someone who's who's in a give back mode um so one of the uh, you know questions for you uh, dr balal is this pandemic season about which you have described made doctors medical professionals do many things differently you know the healthcare model now can you just tell us what that difference was uh, so, so so what's the pivot also been in the indian healthcare uh thanks for the generous words uh, vasanthi uh, minor clarification i was the past president of nat health it's a one year tenure but i got 15 months because I of see. covid they didn't want to change uh, oh, I see. the presidency so i got an extension of 3 months uh, during Happy my to be term. so uh, be as it may i think uh, you cannot be a good doctor without being a good human being so i th- cannot think of uh, anything where you can separate your medical profession from your social activities i think the two have to go hand in hand because our profession is such is where we try to give succor to patients and their families and we also need to give them a non medical kind of uh, assurance that we are there to help them at the time of need it doesn't necessarily have to be only health issues uh, believe it or not a lot of times we will come and talk to me about many different family matters including alliances in the family <laughs> <laughs> so so the medical man becomes a matchmaker at times <laughs> yeah i the, the fun, i must uh, share this with you uh, the funniest thing that happened is uh, once i was on rounds and there was this elderly lady very sweet lady that was getting ready to go home so i did visit her and said and we are glad that you're doing well take care and we'll see you as an outpatient a month from now and she seemed very embarrassed and then said uh, doctor if you don't mind Uh, nimatra on the prashna kella can i ask you something hmm so i said okay we always encourage them to ask questions nimage obba maga idanalla doctor you have a son who's a doctor so right. i said yes yeah. i said yes then the next thing she says is i have a eligible granddaughter do you think we can have an alliance <laughs> so those are the kind of things that people indulge in so uh, what i'm saying is it cannot be hardcore medicine alone i think we should right. practice medicine with compassion and uh, of course uh, it was probably inappropriate but i took it in my stride and said he's still young he has more degrees to achieve so <laughs> he's not going to get married now so that kind of a thing but th- these things do happen but what has happened uh, in uh, before we move on to anything else in corona is that we have had both the clouds of corona with many silver linings of course everyone is aware of the clouds of corona the lockdowns the effects uh, on the uh, e- uh, economic front on the healthcare front loss of footfalls in the hospital significant yeah. uh, damage to non covid care which is a seri- which was a serious serious event people couldn't go to the hospital right. even when they needed it and uh, especially in my field dialysis which is three times a week people going for dialysis was a huge problem there was a huge physical uh, financial and mental stress uh, for the healthcare workers 
And yeah. of course, uh, because the internal migration crisis, many of our projects were postponed because there were no uh, workers available at that time. Many of the projects were postponed by six months to a year. So these were all sort of uh, well-known uh, clouds of corona. But there was mm. there were many, many silver linings which people don't talk about. First and foremost to me was the acceptance of digital health, which we'll talk about a little later, I'm sure. Yes. Second is uh, there was a significant decrease in the non-COVID respiratory illnesses, whether it's flu, cold, cough. During that peak mm. COVID, we never saw any cold or cough even at home, because everyone was maintaining distance, not coughing, yeah. or following yeah. cough etiquette, and uh, hardly any non-COVID respiratory illnesses. And very interesting statistics, uh, Vasanti, during the first few months of COVID, there was a significant decrease in the death rate because the accidents in the country had come down drastically because people were not traveling. And of mm. course, there was a lockdown. So the number of uh, motor vehicle accidents had significantly come down. The other That's important right. things that happened was that healthcare sort of was recognized as the prime mover in the country and was given the importance it richly deserved. And uh, more importantly, I think uh, the medical profession regained its nobility. We were getting tarnished for various reasons, and this brought back the nobility, which was very close yeah. to my heart. And of yes. course, uh, in the field of science, what vaccines which would take about 8 to 10 years to develop were developed in a matter of 8 to 10 months, which is a stupendous success for our scientific community. And these are right. the good things that happened with Corona. I'm not saying that uh, Corona was all bad or all good. Certainly, it was a balance, probably more worse than uh, good happening out of it. But at least... There's a lot of good which we should carry on for the future. Yes, doctor, it's it's uh, uh, important to look at it uh, as a whole. Um, I want to draw your attention, in fact, to the rural side of uh, healthcare. So, uh, somebody who's what, also what looking was, at uh, very unfortunate. Uh, uh, Vasanti was, I think, uh, the cities by and large were well equipped, whether it's medical facilities, experts, infrastructure, so on and so forth. But unfortunately, uh, the worst affected areas was rural healthcare, and this actually made the government invest a large amount of uh, money uh, allocation mm. to, uh, in the previous budget, where a significant importance was given to rural health. There was a need for strengthening of the uh, uh, PHCs or the primary health centers, taluka hospitals, district hospitals, and most importantly, we had to bridge the rural urban divide both manpower issues infrastructural issues and to a large extent our uh, digital health moves helped us yeah. bridge this divide and that's played a great great role and these are some of the lessons we have to carry on for the future too so i think there have been many lessons learned hopefully we won't forget them and we'll do that uh, for better planning for the future just a right segue from what you mentioned, because in 2020, India has announced a national digital health mission. So, so to actually look, uh, you know, look at so many aspects uh, to bridge this gap that, that you were just referring to, you know, with, between the urban uh, and the and the rural thing, and also to digitize the health records, because there's so much so much disparity, Doctor Balal, in in the kind of services that is that that is available in cities versus tier two towns versus villages where some of the places it's it's absolutely non-existent and telemedicine can can play such a, a, a greater role there there needs to be uh, in investment just so that even the unreachable areas of of india have that access to healthcare uh, via technology so i think that, that is a growth we will see in the in the next few years uh, i do hope so because i think for uh, decades uh, digital health uh, was sort of uh, in a quagmire because of legal and regulatory issues. Everything changed in the last week of March 2020. I call that the red letter week in the history mm. of digital medicine. Over a matter Surely of few days, the government uh, um, uh, made it possible for us to use uh, teleconsults and use digital health for healthcare in not only within the cities, but more importantly, in the rural areas. And something that will always stay etched in my mind is one incident that happened soon after we started teleconsults. I had this I uh, elderly gentleman who used to come from one of the remotest parts of West Bengal. It would take him about 24 to 48 hours to reach Bangalore, maybe spend half an hour with me at most, and then another 48 hours to go back to Bengal. And because uh, there was a lockdown, we told him we could use uh, telemedicine. 
or make it as a virtual consult. Unfortunately for him, I think he had a granddaughter uh, who was familiar with her uh, computers and she used a laptop. I do not know how uh, they managed to get the connectivity, but they did. So I saw this gentleman um, as a teleconsult. And what was interesting is it was a very, very rural setup. He was on the typical chart points that you see in movies. And suddenly I when I was talking to him, I saw something move behind him. Uh, I sort of didn't uh, oh. get to know what it was. Then I realized... What, was it was the cattle the at his place? And there were cows moving behind him. And we were able to carry on with our conversation. And here we have a teleconsult uh, across <laughs> India, miles away, probably 48 hours of traveling time with a specialist in Bangalore from one of the remotest parts of the country from a cow shed with the help of a laptop and the granddaughter assisting the grandfather. And we achieved what we wanted to achieve. And that is the power of digital help. And I think we should harness that power for the future, there are many wrinkles to be ironed out, but those are mm. issues that can be handled as we go by. But I think this is a great beginning for us and we should uh, capitalize on that. Of course, there are challenges. There, there are these wrinkles that you refer to. I'm going to draw uh, attention to one such, which, which really bothers me, as particularly as a woman, which is the gender inequality in the world of medicine. Um, the fact that why is it that there are so few female doctors in, say, neurology or even your own field, doctor, nephrology, cardiology, gynecology? It's almost like, okay, if you're a woman, you probably must love birth. Uh, so there are these stereotyping. There is all this. Uh, so I see that as a huge challenge, isn't it? Absolutely. The gender you struck the nail on the head. That's something that I've been noticing for decades. Unfortunately, there seems to be not only a gender inequality, but I would call it as a gender discrimination, not only mm -hmm. in women entering medicine, but also in the delivery of healthcare. I think in general, women get poor healthcare as compared to men. And there are enough statistics to show that. I mean, less number of women come for dialysis or transplants, uh, whereas the distribution of the disease is the same among both genders. So in general, uh, women are uh, not able to get the health care they deserve as much as men because we are a patriarchal society uh, and that has to change and should change. And women are more giving rather than taking. If you see the number of people coming forward to donate the kidney, it's always yeah. about 70 or 80 percent women donating versus 10 to 20 percent men donate, donating uh, to their wives, uh, mothers, sisters, whatever. There are very few good men left. But the important what point is the, what is the thought usually behind this doctor? I remember, and it was a very disturbing aspect. But but it's true what you said that somehow it's also taken for granted that the woman, the family can spare the kidney, whereas the man is you know has to go out and work. So uh, how do you even address these these uh, these gaps in the system? No, I think it's mostly a patriarchal society that we live in. Secondly, I do believe that women are more giving than men, uh, whether it's at home or wherever. I think they are more giving. They're more compassionate in general. So I think they come forward more easily. Of course, uh, there's also issues of coercion in some cases. And we hmm. uh, try very hard to make sure that when someone comes forward to donate, uh, there's no coercion. And if there is a coercion, we actually make it as a white lie. We tell them she's not fit to donate. Because oh. much of pressure for her. That's a lie for a good cause, isn't it? Yes, yes, absolutely. We have had instances where uh, they'll say, my sister will donate or my wife will donate. They'll bring them. And then we find out that the person was really not very keen. Then we hmm. tell them that she's not medically fit to donate. Uh, because hmm. we certainly cannot do something that is not right. It's unethical. So, And we don't want to put the lady into any kind of a problem at home. So we tell them they're not fit. But you raised a very important uh, issue about women in medicine. Hmm. It's, uh, I've seen this for decades because I've been part of medical education and I get invited for a lot of convocations uh, to be the chief guest, so on and so forth. And I've seen a significant uh, trend which has changed in the last uh, couple of decades or more. Initially, when I used to go for these convocations, almost 70 to 80 percent of the people getting the degree were all uh, boys and uh, 20 to 30 percent mm. by women but that has changed now uh, i think now there are about 70 percent women and 30 percent men or maybe at least 60 percent women and 40 percent men 
But what has changed dramatically is in the olden days, about 90% of the ranks went to men. Whereas now okay. I think 90% of the ranks go to women. So I keep asking the boys, what's happened to you guys? You have stopped studying, <laughs> is it? Because almost always now, we have to hand over the blue ribbon or the gold medals to the women because they have done exceedingly well in medical college. However, there are certain fields that uh, people still uh, have some reservations, I guess, about uh, going to a lady doctor, mostly in the super specialty surgical fields like cardiac surgery, neurosurgery, yes. or any kind of surgical fields. That's what I uh, wanted to know about. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, that again is a uh, mindset we need to realize that women have better hands than men in addition mm. to being very proficient in what they do. If you see, uh, basically, women have uh, much finer skills than men in general. So surgery is no different. It's the mindset that we need to change. Believe it or not, when I first went to training in the US, uh, that was probably about 30 or maybe closer to 40 years ago, uh, one of my postings was uh, in surgery. One okay. of my first postings was in surgery. And my colleagues, I had just gone to the US, I was fairly new to the system. Uh, this guy said, I believe you're going to be posted in surgery. So I said, yes. And then he had a smirk on his face. So I said, uh, well, I, I really don't know why you have that smirk on the face. Because I didn't know. He said, they will see your boss tomorrow, then you know. The, I see. Uh, what happened to be a lady. And those days, it was extremely uncommon even in the US to have lady surgeons as the boss. So most people sort of uh, didn't take it as a compliment being posted in surgery where the lady was a boss. But she was an extremely proficient surgeon, very good teacher. And I had a great time. But what I'm saying is this gender kind of uh, yes. inequality, discrimination has existed. But fortunately, it's getting better. And now I think certainly there are a lot more women in the field, not uh, usual traditional obstetrics and gynecology or uh, pediatrics. Uh, but also in fields that demand a lot of their valuable time. However, I think they have to make their own choices because uh, balancing their uh, life and work is an individual choice. So I have equal respect for women who decide to stay at home. Uh, in fact, I tell uh, many people that being a mm. homemaker is far difficult than being a neurosurgeon at times. <laughs> so, but that's a choice yeah. that they have to make. But certainly, I think uh, we should treat everyone equally. And I'm glad that more uh, women are in the field. And if you walk into my department, you'll probably see more women than men. And some of the best uh, minds we have had in our department are women. Yes, one has seen that. And uh, one important point that you made about women uh, having academic excellence, more girls topping and, uh, you know, even in, in their medical education. But that somehow also needs to transition and translate into not discriminating when they enter into higher fields of medicine. Um, the other point, doctor, being even the faith of the patients in certain fields uh, where they expect to see a male uh, physician. Like uh, I think the, the uh, opposite holds true when it's a gynecologist, somehow people are more comforted when it's a woman. But in so many other fields, you, you, uh, I also hear from uh, specialists or, or women doctors saying that patients do not trust a certain gender in certain fields. So, I mean, these are also, I think, very, very um, nuanced, uh, this thing of, of how biases work, how our mindsets are as, as a society. Uh, so all in all, it, it should become more fair and equitable, I guess. No, I would think so. But it, these are uh, things that have been happening for generations. So it won't That's happen right. overnight. I think uh, even uh, today, there is some uh, hesitation on part of male patients to go to women doctors, especially in the surgical field. But that is changing. It's it's not the same as what used to be 30, 40 years ago. I think more and more of them accept uh, women doctors in fields other than obstetrics, gynecology, pediatrics. So I think I know of a lot of patients who don't have any qualms about going to a woman surgeon or a woman cardiologist or a neurologist. So I think right. things are changing. And I think as we move further, it will change further. And uh, soon uh, we'll not only be equals, but I'm sure women will be respected far more than men. <laughs> yes, I, uh, one can see that you're you're rooting uh, always for women. You're, you're one of those feminist, uh, you know, strong, ideal doctors. I also want to draw your attention to 
uh, another aspect and i'm glad we are spending time on this podcast on matters which otherwise don't get talked about you know there are so many taboos around topics but in this episode on white coat world we are addressing something which is at the very fundamental level of of medicine there are so many young people young women uh, maybe even transgenders who who would make great strides in in medicine and i think that level playing field is important one of the last questions that i want to ask you on this is on the um, question of ethics itself which is again foundations of good uh, healthcare and the trust between the vaidya and and the and the rogi or the or the doctor and the patient has has always been very sacred particularly in in the indian uh, system you know whether it's family doctors and people tend to trust doctors more but that component dr balal over the past few years i have seen a lot of erosion it's quite possible that you know that distrust also comes in with let's say a corporate healthcare setup the the doctors um the doctors may or may not have anything to do with that that system but what i want to ask you very candidly as a lay person uh, on the show is that how do we ensure that medical ethics are in place how do we use that ethics to build better healthcare for india uh thank you very much for asking me this uh, vasanthi this is a question that's asked of me many times i am very glad that you asked me this question because it is very close to my heart uh i keep asking myself and also whenever i am addressing a young audience i ask them what is it that differentiates a usual doctor from a great doctor and is it just knowledge and skills or is it something else knowledge and skills are certainly essential but my take on this have always been it is compassion empathy hard work and most most importantly ethical practice of medicine and a humane approach is the core of being a great doctor one has to be a good human being to be a good doctor unfortunately there are many in the medical field or at least some in the medical field who may what we call be the black sheep of the society but fortunately for us there are very few and these are the people that we need to police and regulate because if we don't police ourselves someone else will and i also believe that ethics in medicine is something that we should start very early it should be part of the curriculum in all medical schools and also we should have a selection bias when we appoint people at various levels that we place a lot of emphasis and give a lot of weightage to their ethical practice of medicine how humane they are their interpersonal skills rather than medical or surgical skills alone and my le- uh, advice to the senior leaders in the fraternities please lead by example because young minds are very vulnerable they would go by what they see and if they see their uh, teachers mentors professors behaving in a me- ethical compassionate humane way they would follow that and i have seen that over and over again i have seen some students come from uh, uh, backgrounds where their bosses have been not very compassionate and you can see them uh, see that mm-hmm. rubbing on them and i have seen some people who have come from uh, training programs where they have an extremely compassionate ethical uh, training and you can see that change in them so they are very moldable at this age and i think we should catch them young put this up in the medical school curriculum and certainly uh, we should lead by example so that uh, all doctors not only learn the medical skills but also have an ethical bent of mind and practice humane medicine i think as we speak dr there's been always been this raging debate uh, around us about you know the cost of medical education and whether that also plays a part in in some of them thinking that okay you know the the money invested in getting that education in the first place uh, is so huge and sometimes out of reach of uh, people who want to see their children as doctors and see themselves the, you know that later on it's it's also a prime concern how do i repay all those loans and debt so it's a it's really a larger issue um in in um, that that needs to be looked at i think a more uh, holistically uh, absolutely i think uh, see if you have to invest heavily then it's uh, human nature that you expect returns so if yeah. uh, your education is so expensive obviously someone has to pay for it and there is no clear cut answers there's no black and uh, white situation 
what my suggestion is of course there is merit seats but there are few and far in between so not everyone can get in by merit we should have a reasonable cost for medical education and what should happen is there should be scholarships available subsidies available student loans available so that uh, even an average middle class or a lower middle class family should be able to go to medical college if they have a student or a, a son or a daughter who is willing to get into medicine so money should not be a the only barrier to get into education of course you need to have uh, the aptitude you should only get in if you want to be a doctor and if yeah. you want to be a doctor we should have means of sustaining them through that financial hardship which happens even in the us i mean most mm. uh, students parents don't support them or uh, would not want to support them they come on scholarships and uh, student loans so i think something uh, similar should happen and we are glad that uh, at mahe there is an element of scholarship for the brightest of students and that's mm-hmm. something we should emulate in other institutions too and i'm sure uh, the government will work on subsidies and loans for students merit students who want to get into medicine that's right doctor as we wind up the show tell us one secret of being this you know uh, uh, of wearing this smile despite uh, all the all the things that you that you have to do and you know so much of pain and suffering that you have to deal with and uh, you look like you are probably 10 years uh, into the profession as a doctor <laughs> or 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 even less <laughs> hey, <that's laughs> the truth is see, for changing the 50 years to 10 years <laughs> <laughs> so so which means so, you have to tell yeah. us a secret of Uh, you don't look like you have 50 saal half a century spent in the medical profession uh, and and yeah, retain yeah. the same josh yeah. how do you do that? I, i think it's a, a predominantly family influence i had very strong women in my family my mother my wife and of course the other women in the family including my sisters in law i mean i don't have any sisters so the sisters in law were like my sisters and all of them have been strong influences and i must admit that i have never seen my mother be grim she mm. always was smiling and always encouraged us to be happy i think that's ingrained somewhere in my subconscious and i try not to let the situation get hold of me or get the better of me uh, if i am very angry i just don't mm. say anything for a few minutes i oh, try so not to be angry do you <laughs> <laughs> yeah but i try not to show it and i don't uh, react in anger that's what i keep telling my children and my students that if you are angry with something don't burst out as a reaction let it go for about 10 minutes nothing is going to change the world in 5 to 10 minutes after that whatever you have to say you say that and try to be happy because if you are a grim morose doctor which patient would come to you and which patient would be happy taking advice from you i think as doctors we have to spread cheer be happy be smiling listen to them and be compassionate so i don't think you should have a grim appearance be angry throw things around i think that just doesn't uh, that's just not the right behavior so i try to be happy as much as uh, i can and even if i'm not happy sometimes i still present myself as a happy man G- great secrets shared in uh, uh, some of the times when you walk into the doctor's uh, clinic or room uh with with some ailment you just see the doctor and you're cured you see sometimes a doctor she or he doesn't even have to give the medicine sometimes you just see them and you're like you know ha sari ho to na sab theek ho gaya so i think uh, there is a lot uh, of reassurance that that kind of uh, comfort you know that that you feel with with the person who's healing you who's treating you and it's been great to draw some of your own life experiences uh, to to issues that that are you know um, that india is dealing with as a whole so likewise white coat world will will have many many conversations in the weeks and months to come with uh, doctors such as you i'd like to thank you for being my guest on the show dr balal it was my pleasure vasanthi thank you very much yes and that with that we it is a wrap on this episode until we meet you next time namaskara and adab